We're now in the post-Civil War period, and there's something of a puzzle that's been bothering me. Uh, coverture, as we've been discussing it, applied to free women, mostly to free white women. And now in this period after the Civil War, uh, we have a range of free African-American or free black women who've been given the rights of citizenship by the 14th Amendment. And yet one imagines that coverture can't and doesn't fully cover them. Uh, for example, uh, what about their children? Children born outside of the wedlock which coverture so effectively covers, but their children are not born within wedlock if they're born into slavery. Coverture had its mirror, its, its uh, nasty mirror images, one of the nastiest which dates way back to early British law, was that uh, the father, the, the legitimate father, the married father, has power over the children born into his marriage. But if he fathers a non-marital child, he can decide whether or not he wants to make, that be, make himself responsible for that child. And the oldest, English practice had been that the bastard was the child of no one. So it was considered something of a reform when in the sort of Elizabethan era, maybe a little before that, the practice became that the non-marital child was the child of the mother, which meant the unmarried mother has full responsibility for this kid and the father has no responsibility at all. And out of that principle, which is the piece of coverture that is, says what's the exception to coverture, uh, or I don't even know if it's an exception, it's just part of how they thought about the world, um, not only does the free white but unmarried woman have full responsibility for non-marital non children, but it seemed to them absolutely logical that the child of an enslaved woman who could not marry by their law um, was completely responsible for, uh, well, she could protect that child, but that child followed her into slavery, followed the mother into slavery. And that's why uh, Sally Hemings, who is the child of an enslaved woman and a wealthy owner, um, became a slave followed her mother into slavery. Her father's other daughter was Martha Wales, whom Thomas Jefferson married. And she was the child of a free woman, the, the uh, wife. She was of, of the legitimate right. marriage of, of, of right. this guy. Right. Uh, but now come to the post-emancipation so, period. You have millions, literally, mm -hmm. of women who most of whom have given birth outside of the formal wedlock situation. So are their children uh, subject to a father they've never known or may well, not have known formally? Many of these women are pressed into marriage by agents of the Freedmen's Bureau who want everything to be nice and wrapped up and neat. Uh, so many of the freed women, uh, many, freed, many of the freed slaves who had relationships with each other were delighted to be able to marry and to bring their children along with them into freedom. But we know that there is pressure on many formerly enslaved people to marry people who they had some kind of relationship with but would not have chosen to marry in order to look respectable and be respectable. So it's, it's sort of hard to answer your question, except that um, an awful lot of these women are going to end up without uh, partners, 
without protective partners and with children to be responsible for, sure. And it's always going to be easier for the uh, for men to walk away from the non-marital child, that's for sure. But let's invert that a little mm. bit because some of the benefits offered by the Freedmen's Bureau and the Civil oh, yeah. War pensions uh, situation actually can only go to the that's widows, right. the legitimate widows right. of men. So the incentive to marry and here may be one of the issues that leads us right into the 21st century. The incentive of women to marry, of previously enslaved women to marry, is enhanced exactly. by the... Yeah. Absolutely. 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 And of course that of their children at the same Absolutely. time. So marriage now becomes something which is uh, clearly in the interests Absolutely. of many women, if not all women. So when I think about this as a paradox, I think that what free women give up when they marry in terms of their autonomy and so on, African-American formerly enslaved women might actually gain from that is coming under the laws of that, that is true. And one of the pieces of that that they welcome, or that they think they will be able to welcome, is they think in this new marital regime that the husband can protect the wife against exploitation. So we know that the newly formed uh, freed people's marriages often show them to want the women to work, they need the money, they're desperately poor, but they will not work in gangs, they will not work in conditions that echo plantation work. They want to work in their families, serving their families in work often that they can do inside their newly constructed household. 